hear me? Yeah. There we go. Okay, so the title of the talk today is The Evolution of Cooperation, uh, much broader than what I'm actually going to talk about. And exploring further on this would be great, and we're going to have to move a bit fast today so that everything wraps up on time. But today I'm going to talk about Prisoner's Dilemma. And you may have already heard about this uh, through your cartoons, actually. Um, so here's a Dilbert where uh, he's looking over the cubicle of Wally. These peer reviews are like the famous prisoner's dilemma. If you rat on me, but I say good things about you, you get the biggest raise. But if we praise each other, we can both get a small raise. Wally, if you rat him out, I'll let you look at my Victoria's Secrets catalog. And uh, he comes back with, this is exactly why there are no co-ed prisons. <laughs> so we're going to play prisoner's dilemma here in the beginning. Um, I'm going to outline a scenario for you, and you all have a numbered post-it, and you are going to signify your choice of what you would do. Um, if you will, you, I'll explain when we get there, so don't do anything to your, your papers now, but you'll either fold this once or twice to signify your answer, and then we're going to tally things up and see how we did. So here's the scenario, and it may seem crazy, but this is actually based on a real job. Um, in college, we had a little uh, competition going where it was named who had the worst job. And there was one guy who always won. Here was his ter terrible job. Situation was he worked in a styrofoam packing company. So he, they made the styrofoam cups like we have here from time to time. And his job was to, when the sleeve of styrofoam cups came up off the, the machine, the extruder, the bagger. He had to pick them up and put them in a box. And so here's the situation. You're assigned to a two-person crew, and you are either the person who fills the, who takes the bag off the machine, puts it in the box, or you're the person in another room who assembles the boxes and they come down on a conveyor belt. You can't see each other. The problem is, every time you reach for one of these stacks of styrofoam cups, you get a little static shock. <laughs> every time. Now, you can stand on, you know, they, can, they try putting in insulation so that you wouldn't ground out, but that only gets, makes it worse. You just build up more and more and more static until you really get zapped. But, it, you know, it's pretty annoying. It's like when you, uh, in wintertime, go shuffling around on your slippers and touch somebody or touch the doorknob. So, foreman hates assigning people to this task. Nobody wants to do it. He doesn't want to be the bad guy. So, here's what he does. You don't know who's on the team. You don't know who's going to bag or who's going to box. You, you're picked for your turn out of many employees. You don't know who the other person is. And you are asked to either accept the bagging position or refuse the bagging position. If you accept the bag and the other person accepts the bag, then for half the ship you will each bag, and ha the other half of the ship you will box. So you just trade places. If instead you both refuse, then you're automatically both going to end up having to box, to, to do the um, bagging for half the ship, and boxing for half the ship. There's a little bit of a reward in it because they want people to cooperate. So if you both agree to accept the bagging and don't have it forced on you, um, they're gonna give you an extra 10 minute coffee break during the day. If you accept, here's the part you gotta really pay attention to, if you accept to do the bagging and the other person refuses, you do the bagging all day. They don't do it at all, they just box. And the other way around. If you refuse to do the bagging and they accept, then you get the box all day and they have to get shocked all day. So that's the um, scenario that you're faced with. You don't know who it is, you're not allowed to talk about it. I mean, obviously there's a lot of hurt feelings if you get stuck. And so 
you don't know who the other person is on your shift, and you're not allowed to talk about it. In fact, there's a penalty. If you get caught revealing what shift somebody worked, where you worked, which station you worked, you get fired. <laughs> okay, so I want you to take your post-it note and fold it once if you agree to accept to bag. Fold it twice if you're going to refuse. Yes? What if you truly don't care? <laughs> Make a choice. If you truly don't care, they want that kind of employee, they'll fire your butt anyway. Do we know about the shopping before we start Yes. Okay, we're gonna tell these off. Everybody made a choice? Good. Okay, so the two individuals who have number one, if you could please stand. <laughs> and show me, show everyone what you did. So that's a refuse. Is that that's a refuse? Accepted. Okay. Whoa. Okay. Zap. Number two. Who has the twos? Okay. So we've got an accept and an accept. Three. All right. Got a refuse and a refuse. Four. Who's the other four? You're by yourself. That you now. Oh, okay. So we got two accepts. Okay, five. We got accept and accept. It looks like. Okay, six. Uh, we've got a refuse and an accept. Seven. Got a refuse and a. <laughs> Where were we? Eight. Got an accept and a refuse. Nine. Accept and accept. Ten. Refuse and accept. Eleven. Got an accept and accept. Twelve. Refuse and where's our other twelve? No folding. It's <laughs> <laughs> got, got the green twelve. Not twelve. twelve. Uh, maybe we're at the end. Okay, I'm going to no, vote. No, 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 no. You got a lot more than that. Well, looks like I get on work. Thirteen. Maybe they left the room. We've got an accept and an accept. Fourteen. Accept and accept. Fifteen. Refuse and refuse. Sixteen. Accept and refuse. Seventeen. Refuse and refuse. Eighteen. Refuse and refuse. Nineteen. Accept and refuse. Twenty. Accept. Other twenty. Green twenty. And accept. Twenty-one. Refuse and accept. You have to work all day. Uh, uh, Twenty-two. Accept and accept. 23, accept and refuse. 24, accept and refuse. 25, accept and accept. 26, refuse and refuse. 27, accept and refuse. 28, accept and accept. 29, Accept and accept. Do we have a 30? Yep. Yeah. Refuse and refuse. 31. 
Do we have one of those? Yeah, we do. Okay, refuse and accept. Refuse and 34. immediately start a union. Okay, 32. <laughs> accept, 32 green. Accept and accept. 33. Accept and accept. 34. Accept and accept. Okay, we're missing number 12. 12. They come back in. Oh, okay, so we got a uh, refuse, and who had the other? And a refuse. All right, if this was totally at random, right, we would have had one quarter of our outcomes be accept and accept. Not the case, clearly. If everybody were very trusting, we'd have 100% accept and accept because it's the same as refuse and refuse, except you get an extra coffee break, right? So that's where we ought to be. This is the optimal outcome. Um, as a group, um, that's where you would want to be, and you certainly don't want to be in one of these. If I had been voting, I would have voted refuse the way this was set up, and here's why. Number one, I'm the other guy. I could say, okay, if, if my coworker is going to pick accept, what's going to be the best option for me? If I do accept, I've got to get shocked half a day. If I refuse, I don't get shocked. If he refuses, my best option would be to refuse because then I would get shocked for half a day instead of all day. So the situation forces you to take a suboptimal outcome. <clears throat> this is referred to as the Nash equilibrium. Uh, you may have seen um, Beautiful Mind. You may remember the scene where he's sitting in the bar with his buddies and a bunch of women walk in and there's this one stunning blonde in the group and he has this epiphany where everybody should ignore the blonde for the best outcome. And, and because they're going to interfere with each other if they're all competing for the blonde and if they, if they do that then all the other women are going to be angry at them for not paying them any attention and they don't want to be second fiddle. So he rushes out and he works up this mathematics. So that's the Nash equilibrium. And today we're going to talk about how you move from here to here. At least we'll sneak that in at the end. There are actually, you can express this out mathematically. So these are reward scenarios. So that's what R is. T is your temptation payout. You get off getting shocked all day. And S is the sucker payoff. You cooperated, but you paid a penalty for doing it. And then P is the penalty payout you both lose. So um, there is, and you'll see that this meets these conditions, the temptation payout is greater than the reward uh, payout, and that's greater than the punishment payout, and the punishment payout is more rewarding than the sucker payout. Now, the way Prisoner's Dilemma is normally set up what you end up doing is, it's a one, as it was originally formulated, it's a one instance event. Some prisoners are caught, some criminals are caught, and they're put in a situation where they're driven towards snitching on each other and taking a sentence that would be worse than if they both cooperated and kept quiet. And yet, they, they're sitting there sweating, what's my partner going to do is be interviewed separately in another room because if the partner doesn't do it right, they're going to end up going to prison for a long time and their partner's going to get off scot-free. But typically what happens with Prisoner's Dilemma is it's not a one-off um, event. It's usually iterative. You do it and you do it and you do it again. And when that's the case, there's another mathematical condition that applies, and that's that the reward payoff's going to be twice as great as the sum of the temptation and sucker payoffs, because you can flip-flop between your decisions. I don't want to get into that level of it, but we will see some examples along the way. So I wanted to uh, hold on, let me pull this up from my notes. 
<clears throat> so the next thing I wanted to do is actually show you um, a game. And we can take a look at what happens here. Oh, I get to do down here. Okay, here we go. Yeah, volume, please. I'm sorry, we'll have to do this off the microphone. So this is a game called Golden Balls. Can you hear that? So the only way you can guarantee to walk 
away with 6,800. It's by sharing. It's a guarantee that you both put the split ball in. And I do now have to push you for a decision. It's a tough one. We've lost it. We've lost everything. Well, sir, we're walking away with that money because you're an idiot. No, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> we, this could go on all night. These people have got to get up for breakfast. <laughs> Choose split or steal. Abraham, choose split or steal. Now, please. Choose a ball. Right, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go with you. Okay. I'm going to go with you. I promise you I'm going to go You cannot change your balls now. Split or steal. All right, I'm going to uh, leave it there and uh, jump to us. Uh, so what happened? What happened there? We both intended to split, but I think the one guy was trying to use reverse psychology in order to get a different we can turn that response off. out of the guy. He, he, he was actually a good guy, yeah. but he was... <laughs> obfuscating. He was no, he wasn't obfuscating. He was guaranteeing that he controlled the situation by refusing the opponent could only accept or refuse, and if yeah. they refused, they were going to go away with nothing. So he now controlled his opponent. Yeah. He was a good guy, he was honest, he was well-intentioned, but the only way he could control the situation was by deceiving his opponent. Yeah. It looked like what he was doing, he was trying to take his opponent and make his opponent have to do what is the, put him in a situation where the best case scenario was that he would have to trust it afterwards. Right. And otherwise, it was a, there was a no-win situation for him any other way. Right. So he had to do split. There right. was no other way for any other possible good outcome if he didn't do split. Right. So now he knew what his opponent was going to do. His opponent was going to split, and he was now safe to split. Yes. In that, in that show, did everyone in all future episodes of that show now do that? Nope. <laughs> and so what I was going to show you was a different one and build from that, but we don't have time to do it, so I'll just summarize it. Um, there are two opponents, and this one lady sits there professing that she is going to split, and the other guy um, does split, and she steals. And it was always her intent to steal, and it was always his intent to split. And the reason it was so interesting was not because of their choice, although she was certainly a great poker player, um, it was interesting because of the audience response. Because she got booed. And that is important. You know, how would this game play out differently if you knew your opponent? Okay, here they got to discuss them. How about if you really knew the person and you knew you could trust them? Right? Then you'd split. But if you don't know, you don't know that person, you don't know what they're going to do, then you're best, then you're stuck. You're, in, you're playing prisoner's dilemma. And what I'm going to propose to you as we wrap this up is that that's one of the functions of religion, is to get people in a cooperative mode. There was a paper that came out one year ago looking at prisoner's dilemma and finding that you could actually apply principles of evolution if you do a matrix, you know, this is just two individuals, but, but one version of this is to put a big grid of individuals out there. And you can start out with all cooperators and you can have what's called a defector, somebody who's going to steal. In that grid, they will take over. The cooperators are just like free lunch. And what they found was that, so you reach in, a suboptimal outcome for everybody. You're here at the Nash Equilibrium and you need to get up here. And what they found was that you can get there if you can build a small network where people 
trust each other. In this case, they were connected by reproduction um, and social networks. And I think that that may be part of the reason, one of the functions of why religion is around. It allows there to be a group of individuals that have each other's back where you're safe to cooperate and everybody comes out a little bit further along, a little better ahead. It might even be part of the reason why for certain denominations there's actually real high fecundity. Um, so I throw that out there because of the point I wanted to get to, and I know we're, we're running short on time, but I wanted to go over just a couple other examples because you play Prisoner's Dilemma all the time and you don't know it. Um, so I'm going to throw out just a couple examples real quickly so that you can see how this goes. Um, one, uh, how about Buy America campaign? Okay, you're, you're a factory worker, you buy American, you're supporting other factory workers, you're paying a little more. If you defect, you can get your goods cheaper and the other guy who's cooperating is paying the sucker penalty, gets the sucker payout. They're paying extra for their goods, they keep helping you keep your job, and you're reaping the reward of that. That's an, one example. Uh, the Israeli and Palestinian Authority always go through these uh, tit-for-tat battles. Bomb goes off, somebody gets bombed. Another bomb goes off, and they just respond to each other. That's actually a winning strategy for some versions of Prisoner's Dilemma. It turns out that there's a better solution, and that's tit for tat with forgiveness. They can't forgive all the time because you'll just get taken advantage of. But if you forgive, then you get back to a cooperate, and they're going tit for tat, so their next move is cooperate, you cooperate, 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 until somebody screws it up. Um, global warming for emissions. So we've had all these agreements, it's hard getting all the nations on board for it. Well, one way that that can happen is that everybody's better off if they cooperate and everybody withholds their carbon emissions. But you're looking at down the line and you don't have a defined number of iterations or a defined time point. And so if you're one of the nations that said, yeah, let them do it. You can get the benefit of still polluting, making cheaper goods, and somebody else cleans up the air a bit. The problem is you've got no defined endpoint, and so you're always in that situation where somebody's wanting to cheat. And that's why it's been so hard to hit our goals for global warming control. Uh, do we have anybody here associated with smart recovery? Any of the facilitators? Well, I'm going to throw one in there that's immediately applicable to our group. And that's that uh, there's a behavioral economist and psychiatrist uh, by the name of George Ansel who had uh, claimed that when you do that, you're playing prisoner's dilemma. You can stay clean now and stay clean in the future. That's optimal for you. But the problem with substance abuse is you've also got the option and, and worse would be abuse drugs now and abuse drugs in the future. But there's also the option where you abuse drugs now and you don't do it in the future, but in that scenario, the future never gets here. You're always, you know, it's, it's the New Year's resolution you never do. And the flip of that is you're clean now and you abuse later. And for the abuser, that's like wasted effort. They've made all that personal sacrifice and they're right back where they started. And that's one of the reasons why it's so hard on these to get somewhere with these addiction programs. Uh, prisoner's Dilemma is not unique to humans. Uh, you can find it wherever you see social organisms. Um, one example um, would be with vampire bats. So they're not always guaranteed to get a meal when they go out. If they don't get a meal, they're at risk of starving to death. If they have a meal and one of their colony mates didn't get a meal, if they share food, that helps their colony. Maybe they're saving their future, maybe even. But the, and the other reward is that on nights when they don't find food, they get fed. Now there's the sucker payoff, of course, is that you, know, you, you feed the one who didn't get food and then cold night comes by and you haven't caught, gotten any meal 
and the person, the bat that you're expecting to feed you refuses, and you starve to death. So that sort of selection goes on, and there is a selection for cooperation on that basis. Uh, I am running out of time here, so I think I should wrap it up at that point, but just say that I think there's a lot more to talk about on this topic, and so um, hopefully we can cooperate and we'll get other future speakers who are willing to pick up the ball and do a little more of this. Thank you.